happy to be here. So as Amy mentioned, Sebastian Sung and I together started Flywire uh, now about four years ago. And I thought um, what I could do is tell you a little bit about, you know, why we're doing this, you know, why the fly, um, what my lab does, how we're using the data. I thought all of that might be fun for you all to hear about. So I have a couple of slides, if that's okay. I will share my screen and um, feel free to chime in with questions too, if you have them. Um, I'm happy for this to be a conversation. So um, I'm a professor in the Princeton Neuroscience Institute. I've had a lab here for, uh, I think, uh, about 12 years or so. And as Amy mentioned, I just became the director of the Neuroscience Institute, uh, which is both exciting and a little scary. Can you see my screen okay, Amy? Yep. Okay, awesome. That's great. So, um, yeah, I thought I would tell you a bit about scientific discovery and Flywire today. So, let me see if this works. Okay, so you all know that um, you know you're using this electron microscopy data set to reconstruct the connectome of a brain, and this is the brain uh, you've been working on. Um, it's a entire brain of one female fly, and actually, we're at a time now in science where we have a number of these electron microscopy data sets. So from smaller animals, uh, a maggot and a worm and larger animals fish um, mouse eye this was the project in eyewire and mouse cortex and these are all pieces of the brain because those brains are so big that it's not possible to produce a connectome of the whole brain yet um, but for the fly we're kind of in the sweet spot where the brain is small enough uh, that we can reconstruct the entire volume um, but the animal is large enough or complex enough to have really cool behaviors. So, you know, why fly? Well, um, so here's a fruit fly here. You can see it's about three millimeters long. Uh, its head here, which is packed between these two eyes, is about a millimeter across. Um, so it's tiny. Um, but nonetheless, you can do a lot of really cool things. So flies can form long term memories. They have complex navigational behaviors. They, you know, can travel long distances in search for food. They can forage for food. Flies sleep. Um, so some of you may not know all the behaviors that they're capable of. Um, they obviously have senses like, you know, eyes, ears, nose, etc. So they can hear, see, smell, taste, and feel. They have motivational and internal states. So um, drives to do different behaviors. They can avoid predators, they can select appropriate egg laying sites so they can choose where they want to lay their eggs, and they can find mates and this last behavior is the one my lab has been focusing on for some years now, which is basically what we refer to as social communication in the fly Drosophila. So this is a male fly and this is a female fly and they're running around in a behavioral chamber uh, in in my lab. And you can see that every so often the male is sticking out one of his wings and vibrating it and that vibration produces a song and he produces these song sequences um, that he directs at her and the song has basically two main words. Um, that we refer to as sign, which is like a sinusoid and pulse, which is a train of impulses and so i'll play you a little of the song, so you can hear it. So that's just one sequence of song and it wasn't sped up or slowed down that's what it actually sounds like to the female and he'll sing hundreds of these sequences to her, so this is one sequence here, this is another one. During an interaction like this before you know she decides whether to meet with him or not Okay, so um, this is this behavior has been the bread and butter of my lab for for some years now, this is the Princeton neuroscience Institute, this is where my lab is located sebastian's lab is also here. Um, these are the members of my lab, both past and present, some of them, and, you know, many of them have now gone on to run their own labs or to do postdoctoral, you know, research fellowships at these various institutions. And the work um, that you're participating in is primarily funded through the BRAIN Initiative, which is this, you know, US-based initiative to spur neuroscience research. And so it's a priority for them to do this brain mapping. It's a flagship pro uh, project of the BRAIN Initiative. 
okay, so what have we learned by studying this behavior? Why would we bother to study, you know, flies courting each other? Well, one thing we discovered is that um, so here we're actually doing pose tracking of the flies. This is uh, automated machine learning methods we developed in my lab to track all the movements of flies uh, without having to mark them. And from methods like this and recording their songs, we learned that actually the male fly is constantly measuring how far away the female is and how fast she's moving. And then he uses this information to decide on each moment what to sing. So each moment in time, you know, which mode of song do I produce? How do I sculpt the sequence? Okay. And um, the behavior is so complicated that as he gets further from the female, as he increases his distance to her, he increases his sound amplitude. So he sings louder and louder the further away he gets from her, meaning he's constantly accommodating, you know, this distance and movement of the female. And this is a lot like, um, human conversation in some ways. She um, listens to the sequence, she integrates it over time, and she responds to it. So the reason we like this behavior is because it has a lot of hallmarks that are similar to what um, more complex animals like humans do. They're constantly paying attention to information from the partner, you know, integrating it, and then making a decision in real time. And that the behavior of one animal affects the other animal, etc. And so because it's such a good model for those kinds of complex interactions, um, we study it and uh, tools like the connectome allow us to figure out how the wiring diagram of the brain gives rise to something so complex as conversation or social communication behavior. Okay, so that's the why fly, uh, the answer to the why fly question. And um, uh, I just wanted to sort of highlight this data set where it comes from. So here's here's that female fly, here's the male fly. This little pink thing here is a depiction of her brain. And this is like the spinal cord of the fly, what we call the ventral nerve cord. So the brain you're working on comes from one female and it's just the brain. So we've kind of cut it off at the neck here. And um, I don't know if Amy has shared this before, but the data was actually sectioned Oh, oops, I don't know what happened there. And uh, and then imaged and then a uh, sliced. And then those slices were kind of put back together after imaging. And so from that, you get this automated reconstruction. So this should look more like the kind of neurons you've been looking at uh, in Flywire. And then of course, you all know that after you proofread, you get these you know more perfect looking neurons that don't have these little errors in them where they're missing parts of the neuron, et cetera. So the proofreading you're doing is incredibly valuable. Without it, we cannot make sense of this data. So it's, it's having a major impact on our ability to use science, uh, to do science using this data set. So um, it's a huge contribution. And as Amy announced to you all probably recently, we recently completed, you know, through your efforts and efforts of scientists together, um, the proofreading of the entire central brain. So that's this piece of brain here. It doesn't include uh, the optic lobes, uh, which has been a, a primary focus of your effort. Um, but we're making great progress on finishing those as well. So it's uh, it's been really fast paced uh, progress. And then I just wanted to let you know that actually we're lucky enough for people working on the fly that we not only have this data set you're working on that's here in gray, but we have a second data set from another female fly and it's a portion of the brain. And so that allows scientists to actually make comparisons between what we call the hemi brain and flywire and that's really cool to be able to compare between two brains to ask, is it consistent? You know, what are the differences? And um, uh, yeah, there's just a lot more you can learn by having two samples. Um, sorry, this is a, so that was a little bit of song from the mail. And I just wanted to highlight the kinds of things we've been learning in Flywire. So, so we know that this female fly can change direction and turn based on the song he produces. And we've been, you know, determining using this wiring diagram how that happens in the brain. So for example, uh, we just published a study where we used almost 600 neurons that were proofread in Flywire 
Um, we built a synaptic connectivity diagram for them. So how every neuron connects with every other neuron. And then um, we used it to do some science to figure out actually how the female brain processes the three modes of song, she, the two modes of song she hears um, and how the circuit organization gives rise to the behavior. So that was really cool. And just to let you know that in addition to connectomics, my lab also does neural recording. So we're actually imaging activity from flies while they behave. Here's a little fly running on a treadmill. And this is the microscope here. We're actually imaging activity from uh, the fly's brain uh, while we present it with sensory stimuli. And here's activity from, from this fly's brain. Um, and then we do a lot of behavioral recordings to try to figure out how the wiring diagram gives rise to behavior. So that was that was basically all I wanted to say, just that the work you're doing is super important. And um, uh, yeah, it's having a big, big impact on the science in my lab and science uh, in lots of neuroscience labs in general. So thank you.